Got another set of questions for the bonding and structure topic. And as always, the link to the questions in the description of the video if you wanted to try them first. Okay, so make a start here. You'll notice I've drawn a shape diagram for this SBCL3 molecule. So hopefully you can appreciate the shape is going to be pyramidal. So the reason we get that shape is we've got essentially four electron regions around that central antimony atom. One of them's a lone pair, three of them are bonding regions, and basically they repel each other. Moving on to the next part, so why is this molecule polar? Well, it's down to the fact that the molecule is not symmetrical. So the dipoles in the bonds don't cancel. If that had been a bond to a CL there, where the lone pair is, then it would have been symmetrical, the dipoles would have cancelled, and the molecule wouldn't have been polar. Moving on to the next question about the H2O molecule. So the first thing we'll do is put the dipoles and the lone pairs on the supplied molecule. Remember, oxygen's in group six, and so therefore it has six valence electrons. So we've got one in that bond, one in that bond, so that means it's got two lone pairs. So electronegativity of oxygen is reasonably high, so the dipole is delta minus on the O, delta plus on the H's. So there's the other H2O molecule there, and all we need to do now is show the hydrogen bond, which goes from the lone pair on one of the H2O molecules to the H on another. Next thing we've got to do is state and explain two anomalous properties of ice, not water, caused by hydrogen bonding. So the first thing we'll talk about is the relatively high melting point of ice. So I'm just saying the melting point is higher than expected and that's because extra energy is needed to break the relatively strong hydrogen bonds between the H2O molecules. The other one we can talk about is the relatively low density of ice compared to water. So in the solid state, H2O has a lower density than in the liquid state, which is an unusual property. What's that down to? It's down to the fact that when uh, water freezes, the hydrogen bonds extend slightly and they actually push the water molecules further apart and they create what's called an open lattice structure. Next part of the question, we're going to draw the dot and cross diagram to show the bonding in CO2. So I've just drawn up a shape diagram there just to remind you that between the carbon and the oxygen, we've got double covalent bonds. You see, I've gone for crosses for the electrons for carbon. So carbon's in group four. So we've got four valence electrons, two in each of the double bonds. Oxygen's in group six. So it matches that with its electrons, and that leaves two lone pairs on each oxygen. Part C, we're told silicon dioxide's got the same structure and bonding as diamond. Well, hopefully we can remember diamond as a giant covalent lattice structure. Next part, we've got to talk about the electrical conductivity of sodium oxide and sodium in solid and molten states. So we'll just take each one in turn. So we'll start with sodium oxide. It doesn't conduct when it's in the solid state, and that's because the ions, not electrons, the ions can't move because they're held in the giant ionic lattice. If you melt it, it does conduct, so it does conduct when liquid because the ions, not the electrons, the ions can move. Moving on to sodium, so that's a metal, so it can conduct when solid and liquid, and that's because it has delocalized electrons, which can move. Really sorry, but there's a very noisy plane up in the skies in Hartlepool at the moment, so uh, if it's distracting you, can't really do anything about it. Anyway, so next question, we've got to write the equations for the reaction between barium and water first. So barium and water makes barium hydroxide, which has that formula, and hydrogen. Reaction two, barium nitride is reacted with water forming an alkaline solution. So that's going to be barium hydroxide again. The alkaline gas is going to be ammonia, NH3. So there's the unbalanced equation. So first thing we'll do is put a 3 in front of the BaOH twice, a 2 in front of the NH3, which means we need a 6 in front of the H2O. Structure and bonding in barium nitride, well, we've got a metal and a non-metal, so it's going to be ionic. So in terms of structure, it'll be a giant ionic lattice.
And the final question, we're told that this oxide of barium formed in reaction 3 contains barium ions and peroxide ions. And we've been given the um, formula for the peroxide ion. The easy one is the barium 2 plus ion. Barium's in group 2, so it forms a 2 plus ion, loses its two outer electrons. So I tend to draw a full shell of eight electrons and I use crosses for my metal. You can have an empty shell there if you want. For the peroxide ion, I'll, I'll explain how this one works because it's not as straightforward as the barium 2 plus ion. So I'm using this diagram here. So we've got two oxygens, two oxygens, with a single covalent bond between them. So I've used crosses for barium, so I'm going to use open circles and shaded circles. So let's say the left-hand oxygen is an open circle, the right-hand one is a shaded one. So that's that single covalent bond there. So oxygen's in group six, so we need another five of each type of electron. So there they are there, and all we need to do now is show the two minus charge. Well, obviously, we've gained two electrons, and they'll have come from the barium. So they need to be crosses, because I used crosses for my barium, and that's it.